Uh, good morning once again. Now, I promise you this service today is not sponsored by Disney, but I'm going to start with a line from Disney. In Bambi, there is a wonderful line from Thumper the Rabbit, who says, if you can't say nothing nice, then don't say nothing at all. And that's my attempt at an American accent, which wasn't very good. I suppose in some ways I could say amen and sit down, and that would summarize a sermon. But actually, it doesn't. Because there is so, so much more to this passage than simply saying nice things when we talk to one another. Indeed, as with James, there is so much more. He starts with a really stark warning. Not all of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, because you know that you will be judged more severely. Uh-oh, should probably go and sit down then. That could be enough to put somebody off teaching. However, when we look at what he says there more closely, we can see just why they may be judged more, they will be judged more severely. Because teachers have great power. They have the opportunity to foster someone and support them achieve their potential. But they also have the power to destroy someone in a few short words. If I think back to my time in education, I remember the names of the teachers who have supported me, fostered me, encouraged me, guided me. But I can also remember the names of those teachers who had a negative impact on me. I was never any good at sport, and I still remember the digging comments from the teachers when perhaps I wasn't running quite quick enough, or I wasn't able to score that goal that they really wanted me to score. But those that didn't really make an impact on me, the good or, either in a good or a bad way, I've sort of forgotten their names. I remember those who have taught me. I remember those within the church that have had a big impact on me, that have fostered my vocation to get me to where I am today. Because quite often when we're looking at a vocation, it's not ourselves that find the vocation. It's when others say to us, have you considered this? And that doesn't just mean ordained ministry, friends. Vocation is for everyone, not just those of us that wear a collar. But if we think about teachers being judged more severely, how much more so is that amplified when we think about the church? How much damage can be done by somebody standing in a pulpit or on a platform preaching and teaching the Word of God? Sadly, we know too well that there are many who have used such a platform to manipulate, to pursue their own agenda, to do what they want, to get out what they want. Think of all the celebrity prosperity gospel preachers that have gone you know, to get all the money they can, to buy the fanciest private jet they can. That's not service. But for all of those that have used this place to manipulate and to share their own agenda, Think of how many people, and I hope I'm one, who use this platform to preach and teach the Word of God. As an ADDO, one of the things we often ask candidates for ordination is, are you sure you really want to go down this route, friends? Because the route of discernment is a lonely place, and it can cause heartache. Indeed, in ministry, it can be a very lonely place, and it can call heart, cause heartache. Indeed, all those of you who are leaders in your field know that leadership is a lonely place sometimes. But think of the great power that we have to make an impact for good or for bad. But after this stark warning to teachers, James then makes it more general. He widens it out to everyone because he says we need to tame the tongue and watch what we say. Yet, he also goes on to say that it's almost an impossible task. So should we give up? No. Essentially, what James is saying to us is that when we get the tongue under control, we have our entire self under control. So it seems that it's the tongue that's the last part of the body to learn the lesson. Because we know that saying the wrong thing at the wrong time can cause irreparable damage to a relationship. 
a broken promise, a bad impression given, to name a few examples. There are many stories, sadly, of people going to church, hearing something said either from the front or from somebody sat next to them, and then never, ever walking through the door of a church again. I go back to a time when I was in curacy and my tire burst on the way to a service in the afternoon. I'm sure I've shared this story with you before. And uh, I had to wait for a rescue truck to come and pick me up. And it so happened that my training incumbent's husband came and picked me up, took me to the church. He went away with my car, but that's by the by. But when I got in that rescue truck, I was in in a suit with my collar on. He goes, why at your age are you in the church? And now through the conversation, it transpired that he used to be in the church. He used to be a member of the choir at his church. He'd had a falling out with a vicar 40 years ago and had never set foot through the door of a church again. So the parting words when he dropped me off at the tire place on a Sunday afternoon in Morecambe was, I challenge you, go to church. Whether he did or not, I don't know. Even in the Psalms, though, Psalm 141, verse 3, the psalmist prays that God would put a sentry in front of his mouth because he knows that there is so much damage that can be done. James goes even further and says that the tongue is a fire ready to set things ablaze. If we look at the state of the world today, friends, this is more evident than ever. Reporters trying to trip up a politician or another public figure. They're twisting words to make it sound like what they expect it to say, to make it sound much worse than it actually is, or much better than it actually is. The legal profession, which I was part of, lawyers exploring every single word to get something out. What's the meaning behind them saying, I saw somebody fall over? In in court. Barristers not letting witnesses finish their sentences. It's all the power of words that a jury will then make a decision on, hopefully evidence too. But we use our words to manipulate and try and twist things to win the way that we want to do. And we know that one word spoken can destroy something that's taken years and years to build. These days, if we could take it even further, because social media is responsible for so much damage, because of words that are said. Amanda spends a lot of time on social media, particularly when she's feeding feeding Joseph. And she's told me about a few debates she's been having with people about what it means to be a vicar's wife. There are those that say, well, you should be baking the cakes. You should be at church every day. You should be running all of the ministries. You should be running the Sunday school. No, that's not what a vicar's wife is. It might have been in 1950, but now Amanda is her own person. When you appointed me as the vicar, you didn't get me and Amanda to run the church. As it happens, we do because that's what God called us to do. But Amanda is her own person doing her own thing, listening to what God is calling her to do. There is so much damage that can be done by these people who clearly don't have a clue what they're talking about. And I actually wonder if one of the comments you showed me, if that person had ever even set foot in a church. But that's by the by. I read in the news this week that it was a comment from somebody in Sweden who talked about how, uh, how, to, how to start a fire or something that led to some of the riotous acts we saw in this country earlier this year. It's powerful, is the tongue. But it's a small thing, and it can do so, so much damage. Perhaps if James was writing the letter today, rather than just saying, tame the tongue, he'd be saying, tame your fingers because of the mobile phone, because of a computer. Whilst there are so many positive things that it's brought into the world, there are also far more sinister things behind it. 24-7 bullying, it doesn't end in the playground anymore. The arguments on social media that become public that should never have been public. The constant desire for people to pick holes in one another's arguments. The desire to say this is the truth when it's actually utterly false. The list goes on. Those small devices in our pockets which are more powerful than the computers which took Apollo 11 to the moon, carry great power within our lives today. But it's not the technology that's the problem. It's how we use it. So perhaps we could add in, James says, tame the tongue, but tame the fingers too when we're at the keyboard. Tame the fingers when we're thinking of typing something onto Facebook or other social media. And just pausing and thinking, Would I actually say this in real life? 
Because I bet 50% at least of the stuff you wouldn't actually say in real life. Which in many ways, all of that brings us to the main point that James is talking about. Why is the tongue like this? Jesus tells us in the Gospels that what comes out of the mouth is a sign of what is really there deep in our hearts. Matthew 12, 34, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus is telling us what we say reflects what's in our heart. James reflects some of Jesus' teaching then. If someone is pouring out curses from the tongue, cursing others who are made in the image of God, then we need to look at the heart and see what's going on. Sometimes we have to look behind the words that are said. As part of my curiosity training, one of the requirements was to attend a CPAS course called uh, Bridge Builders. It's all about conflict resolution. And it's about how we manage conflict within the church. Because let's face it, church is a place where conflict is ever present. Indeed, Eugene Peterson says, Never trust a pastor who says to you, There is no conflict in my church. Because they are lying to you. One of the main things behind the bridge builders, though, is to look beyond the presenting issue and see what the root cause is. Often someone will use words that are hurtful or damaging because they're trying to protect themselves from something else. Or they're taking their frustration out in the wrong way. When I was going through counseling after Hannah was born, I discovered my overreactions were because there was an underlying anger issue that I'd not dealt with from, when I, from my early childhood that needed resolving. At the moment, I'm currently listening to Tyler Statton's book, Praying Like Fools and Living Like Monks, this one. And I was particularly struck this week when I was sat in the McDonald's car park having lunch about what he says about impatience and anger. He talks of a time when he was going to a midnight prayer meeting, and he says this. As of this moment, it's impatience and anger that have a hold on me, which has the potential to sound okay if you keep it general, which is a well-cultivated habit of Christian pastors. But if you were in the room for some of the petty arguments I've started with my wife, or some of the moments in which rage spilled out of me, directed at my toddler-aged children, it wouldn't seem so general. Ten days prior to this writing, the community I pastor gathered for midnight prayer and worship to start a season of 24 hours a day prayer. Unceasing prayer. Revival, right? Come on! But that very day, I yelled at my son Hank three separate times. And I promised myself I wasn't going to use that form of discipline anymore because for me, it's about me releasing my anger, not about teaching him. Friends, that struck very true for me. The times I have slipped the tongue and perhaps lost it a bit with, the ch with my toddler-aged children. And then I've come to stand up before you and preach, particularly when they're not putting their shoes on and we need to get to church. They're not putting their coat on and we need to get to church. Nowadays, oh, I need a wee just before we go out the door. It's so easy to slip but actually, it's not about that. We have to be careful with our tongue. There are so many times when I've said to Hannah, she won't go to sleep, will you just go to sleep? Daddy has work to do. And then I'll go downstairs feeling really guilty because I've said the wrong thing at my child. And it was actually, it wasn't the fact that Hannah wasn't going to sleep. It was my lack of organization, which meant I was writing the sermon at 9 o'clock on a Saturday night, which I promise I never do. <laughs> not supposed to lie from this stage. I have done that on more than one occasion. But what matters to us is that we realize the words we use, whether verbal or written, should reflect Jesus in us and through us. It is part of our discipleship that we learn to be more like him and mirror him in what we do. If we look to Scripture for guidance on this, we find passages such as Isaiah 53 verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent. 
So he did not open his mouth. Or oh, Mark 14, 60, 61. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. There are lessons for us in this, friends. We don't always have to react with our tongue and say the first thing that comes into our mind. As part of our discipleship, we need to choose our words carefully like Jesus did. Jesus knew what to say and when to say it. He knew how to say it in a way that people would listen. He wasn't there to say what the crowd wanted to hear, which is something we're not very good at. We try to avoid those awkward conversations because we don't want to go there. As I said the other week, we're too nice in church because we're not willing to speak up when people go astray, away from the word of God. We have to know when to use our words, when to challenge and admonish one another, as well as speaking words of love to one another. James is after consistency as disciples of Jesus. Because he wants people, he wants me and you to follow Jesus with all of our being, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our body, including the tongue. He wants us to be people who are only blessing, not blessing and cursing. And I imagine we're all guilty of the latter. But perhaps we're just not as willing to admit it as we should The danger is that people take parts of the message that they want and they leave the real challenges to one side because they're just too difficult. But it can't be done because that's not what the gospel is about. The gospel is not about us being nice to everyone. Shock horror. The gospel is about matters of life and death because it is about salvation. And sometimes that will mean the hard conversations. Sometimes that will mean the challenging conversations. Sometimes that will mean saying to somebody, I love you as my brother or sister, but you cannot continue doing what you are doing. Teachers have a great responsibility. But we too, as followers of Jesus Christ, have a great responsibility to share the gospel with those around us. Because no matter who we are, if we allow Jesus to take our tongue, our words can lead someone out of death and into life. There's a chap in America called Dennis Gian, and he tells a story of how the gospel can bring about transformation. He says, my neighbor, who was an arrogant and wealthy businessman, scorned the church for many years. Whenever church members phoned him, he would criticize them. You church people are only interested in my money. You don't care for me. You only care about my pocketbook. But then he became ill and paralyzed. Then he says, when I went to visit him, to my utter surprise, his entire room looked like a flower shop. Cards were posted everywhere on the wall. The flowers and cards from the church members who he so disdained for many years. And posted on the wall facing his bed was a big sheet of paper that said, I was wrong. The church does care. Later, he became a Christian. In that instance, the tongue is the voice of the church with grace and compassion that brought about a life-giving change to Dennis's neighbor because the church had made its true nature known. Even when people despise us, even when people say the wrong things towards us, or they ridicule us for following Jesus, hold your tongue. That's what James is saying. Tame it. Don't rebut it with, an, with anything. Take it on board, well, don't, but don't, don't listen to it. When somebody says that thing to you, just say, well, I love you just as Jesus does. I know it's easy to stand here and say that. But let's be people who have our tongue tamed, who are able to use the spirit of Jesus living within us to bring about transformation, to bring about the good news. Because who knows, in a year's time, perhaps one of us will be stood here giving a testimony ourselves for that neighbor who so despises the church that is right now sitting next to you in this very building. 
It is a challenge. But I want to encourage us as we journey out into the week ahead, let's reflect on how we use our tongue, both within and outside of the church. I know I've been convicted by this passage. I know I need to take these words seriously. I wonder whether you do too. As we sang just moments ago, I just want to speak the name of Jesus over my family, over society. Friends, let's be those people who just want to speak the name of Jesus to all who we meet. Let's pray. Father, we know that we stray from your word with our tongue. We know that it's hard to tame. We know that our tongue can cause so much damage to relationships that we've spent years building. But equally, we know that our tongue is something that can bring about life and transformation. It can bring people out of death and into life, out of darkness and into light. So, Father, we pray that as your disciples, as a family of Jesus gathered here this morning, that we would learn to use our tongue the way James asks us to. We pray that we would learn from your son, Jesus Christ, to not speak up when we don't have to, to choose our words carefully so that we can speak the name of Jesus as a blessing over people. Father, we can use our tongue to curse, but we can use our tongue to praise. And this morning, I pray that we would use our tongues to praise you as our awesome God.